So hi everyone, my name is Gilles Pezin and I'll be chairing this uh, second session on the scheduling. Uh, in this uh, session, we have three regular talks and one short talk. So the first talk is entitled CP and hybrid models for two-stage batching and scheduling. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be presenting our paper titled CP and hybrid models for two-stage batching and scheduling completed with J. Christopher Beck and with the support of Visual 8. So batch scheduling is a class of scheduling problems and it arises when it is desirable that a set of jobs sharing common characteristics are processed together either consecutively or simultaneously on the same resource. And one example of a complex real-world batch scheduling problem comes from the area of composites manufacturing. And the goal of this paper is to examine the core complexities of this complex manufacturing process. And to do that, we define and solve an abstraction, which we call the two-stage bin packing and hybrid flow shop scheduling problem. And this will allow us to more easily investigate the relationships between these core constraints. So at a high level, this figure here shows the flow of jobs through this scheduling problem that we are discussing today. So jobs are associated with a size, a due date, as well as a processing time in stage one. And what we do with these jobs is we pack them into tool batches in a bin packing problem. Tool batches are constrained by a tool capacity, and then they are scheduled in stage one, which we call the layup stage, where its processing time is actually the sum of processing times of its jobs. After stage one, we take these tool batches and we pack them again in a second bin packing problem into autoclave batches. Autoclave batches are all constrained by the same preset capacity, and they are scheduled in stage two, which we call the curing stage, um, using a preset processing time as well. So it's the same across all autoclave batches. And this allows us to obtain our completed job. So we can see here um, this hierarchical batching structure of jobs into tool batches and then tool batches into autoclave batches can be considered a bin packing problem. And we can also see how scheduling activities in two stages, both of which are multi-capacity and have precedence, can be considered a hybrid flow shop scheduling problem. Hence the title, two-stage bin packing and hybrid flow shop scheduling. So we develop solution approaches in three categories. For exact methods, we have a mixed integer programming model that uses a time index formulation. We have a constraint programming model that uses interval variables. And we have two logic-based vendors decomposition models with different cuts. And both of these LBBD models are using uh, a combination of mixed integer programming and constraint programming to model their master and sub problems. We also have a purely heuristic method called the greediest early, earliest due date heuristic. And then what we did was we took the constraint programming model and the greedy earliest due date heuristic, and we combined them to create two hybrid methods. And now the first one is just taking the EDD solution and using that to warm start the CP model. And the second method um, fixes the packing of an EDD solution and then uses the scheduling constraints from the CP model to try and improve the schedule given that fixed packing. And what these two methods aim to do is take advantage of the EDD heuristics ability to find solutions very quickly, as well as the CP model's ability to improve solutions over time through tree search. And next, let's take a closer look at the two LBBD models um, because they do have a fairly unique structure. 
So this shows the structure for the first model, and we can see that it's actually a three-stage decomposition. Um, a larger separation happens between the master problem and the subproblem, where the master problem contains all of the packing decisions, and the subproblem contains all of the scheduling decisions. Um, but within the master problem, we have a second separation, and the M master problem is actually responsible for packing jobs directly into autoclave batches in a one-stage bin packing problem. And then we take these sets of jobs in autoclave batches, and we move on to the M sub problem, where we try to partition these jobs um, into feasible tool batches, and we call this a pattern bin packing problem. The problem is, is that we can um, oftentimes not find feasible partitionings. And if we can't solve the problem to feasibility, then we need to add these feasibility cuts uh, for each infeasible autoclave batch from the current solution. And these cuts take the form of a type of CP global constraint called the GCC constraint, where it basically prevents the set of jobs in this infeasible batch from ever appearing again in any autoclave batch of subsequent solutions. If we can manage to find a feasible partitioning of jobs, then we can exit what we see here as loop one and move on to the sub problem where we are scheduling all of the uh, batches that we made in the master problem in a two stage hybrid flow shop scheduling problem. Now, after we solve the subproblem, we have now obtained a full solution to this problem, and we want to restart this process all over again. So to restart this process, we need to add these no good optimality cuts. And for each existing autoclave batch in the current solution, we introduce an auxiliary variable called omega. And if we set this omega variable equal to one, that will basically enforce uh, this autoclave batch from the current solution to be different in subsequent solutions by preventing its set of jobs from appearing again. And then we just make sure that at least one omega is equal to one to remove the current solution and its symmetrical solutions from the search space. This figure here shows the structure for the second LBBD model. And we can see that it's mostly the same as the first model, with the exception of this second set of cuts that we are adding after each time we solve the subproblem. So to add these cuts, what we do is after each time we solve the subproblem, we then solve a relaxation of this problem, which we call the relaxed scheduling problem. And if we can, man if we can manage to solve this relaxation to optimality, that actually gives us a lower bound. And then we can add these lower bounds as cuts back into the master problem to hopefully cut off larger sections of the search space than if we didn't have the lower bounds. So we tested these solution approaches that I talked about on instances with five to 100 jobs per instance, given a time limit of 60 minutes, as well as an LBBD component time limit of 10 minutes, just to prevent these uh, the LBBD components from timing out. And we can see here that the CP model, as well as the two LBBD models um, are already showing signs of degrading performance at less than 100 jobs per instance, which is not a very good sign because real world instances um, have on average about 4,000 jobs per instance. And the MIT model is not even on this graph because the MIT model was not able to solve a single instance um, that it was tested on. Now, the heuristic method and the hybrid uh, methods are a bit more promising, um, being able to find feasible solutions for every single instance tested. And we can see from these two graphs, uh, 
an even uh, more detailed breakdown of how well these um, solution approaches are performing. So on the left here, this shows the time to the best solution uh, within one hour for each of these solution approaches. And we can see that the CP model, the two LBBD models, as well as the warm started CP model are all taking a fairly long time to find the best solution within one hour. And this is um, not desirable when solving real world problems because uh, companies don't have time to sit around and wait for a solution, uh, wait for solutions. They want these solutions to be calculated very quickly. And so the EDD heuristic, as well as just as well as the hybrid approach where we're fixing the packing and then improving the schedule um, are performing quite well. They're finding solutions very quickly, um, almost instantaneously. And on the right here, this graph shows the average optimality gap of solutions found by each of these approaches. And taking a closer look at just the EDD heuristic, which is the blue line, and the hybrid approach where we're fixing the packing and improving the schedule, which is the pink line, um, we can see that uh, the solutions uh, it's finding at lower, at smaller instances does is of lower quality than the LBBD models. Um, however, once we get to these larger instances, the uh, hybrid approach as well as the heuristic um, are actually able to find fairly comparable uh, solutions in terms of quality to the LBBD um, models, which is very interesting. So as we just saw, the hybrid techniques actually performed relatively strongly in comparison to the mathematical formulations. And the complexity of the problem does lend itself to CP, but as we saw, scaling is obviously an issue for complete approaches. And the next step is to consider the complexities of the original problem that were abstracted away, as well as increase instance sizes to match the real world. And ultimately, um, a conclusion that we can draw is that the success shown by the EDD heuristic, as well as the hybrid approaches, suggests that complex problems, such as the two-stage hierarchical batching and scheduling problem that we discussed today, actually pose a very difficult challenge for the development of robust and efficient exact methods. And thank you for listening. Thank you. So are there any, so the speaker is here, great. Are there any questions either by chat or live? Well, let me, let me start uh, with one. So the EDD seems to uh, really work very well here. So you've combined it with CP. Yes. Um, would it make sense to combine it with some of the other approaches that you considered? Because the CP on its own didn't seem to do very well, right? Right, compared to the others. So if you used EDD with, if that's possible with some of the other like approaches, would that uh, yield something even better? So the other approaches, I'm assuming you're talking about the two decomposition approaches. So yeah, that yeah. is essentially um, sort of what I'm doing because for the hybrid method, um, I'm taking the EDD solution and then actually using the sub problem from the uh, two decomposition models, which is uh, comprised of the scheduling constraints um, from the CP model and using those to improve this heuristic solution um, given a fixed packing. Um, and I don't, I don't think that a using the EDD heuristic with, let's say, a MIT model would perform better than CP because of the um, global constraints that we're able to exploit when we're using CP, especially for scheduling. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And so you mentioned that um, you're studying an abstraction of the real life problems. Mm -hmm. So the EDD is doing very well. Uh, if you, uh, I think you mentioned in the future work of looking at the, the more realistic problems, uh, will, do you think that EDD will work uh, just as well there or is it, does it just fail and then you need something else? 
so I actually did already extend it to the full problem. Um, it's uh -huh. written in uh, my master's thesis. It's uh, so it's online right now um, if anyone's interested. And yeah, so it followed a similar pattern where this sort of hybrid approach of using CP not as a complete um, method for solving the entire problem, like using a monolithic model, but rather using CP uh, to improve sections of the mm -hmm. solution when we already have a heuristic solution. So that was actually the approach that also worked the best for the full solution or for the full problem. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to the next talk? I don't see anything in the chat. And I'll remind you that there's time at the Q&A uh, sessions, individual Q&A sessions uh, right after this uh, session. Okay, thank you very much again. And we'll move to the next talk, which is entitled Robust Resource Planning for Aircraft Ground Operations. So hello everyone, this is Yamor. I'm a PhD student from University of Edinburgh and I will talk about our paper on robust resource planning for aircraft ground operations or aircraft turnaround operations. And this research was conducted during my visit in Monash University together with Daniel Guimarans, Peter Stecki, my supervisor Maurizio Tomasella from University of Edinburgh and Jamalton Osterk from Right Hand Technologies. So first of all, to give you a little bit background information, um, there are different activities during a turnaround. So the aircraft turnaround is when an aircraft arrives uh, to the gate and there are several operations that needs to take place to make the aircraft ready for the uh, next departure. Um, so this can be, uh, for example, uh, refueling, baggage loading, unloading, cleaning, maintenance, and so on. And there are some things that uh, we need to be careful, especially about the president's constraints, because some uh, activities they need to wait others to finish. For instance, um, passengers cannot board before fueling is finished. And there are also space related constraints such as uh, toilet servicing and water servicing. They need to use the same physical space to do the operation. So either one needs to be done before the other. And the time the duration of the tasks, they depend either on the aircraft uh, family, for instance, if it's a low cost, um, sorry, the business model, if it's low cost carrier or a full service carrier and also the, um, based on the duration of the flight, some tasks might uh, take less time. Um, so just a single scheduling of a single uh, aircraft, it sounds uh, actually easy and not really challenging. However, when we look at the whole airport, uh, then things becomes more challenging because we need to consider all the aircraft at the airport throughout the day. And that's what we are actually going, we are doing. We are looking at the whole airport. And we have a long-term and short-term planning steps. First of all, we start getting a flight schedule. It's usually six months prior to the day of operations. And then uh, we schedule all the uh, activities in the airport for all aircraft. And the first aim is to minimize the tardiness so that there are the aim that there are no delays with the schedule of these activities, these tasks. And then we minimize the number of resources for each service providers because there are different service providers working on the uh, airport to, uh, to give those tasks, to supply those uh, operations. So we need to focus on all these service providers and try to minimize those resources. And after six months closer to the day of operations, sometimes the flight schedules gets updated. So we run through the same thing with uh, scheduling of all tasks, minimizing tardiness and minimizing the number of resources. And after that getting, we, so we get the uh, starting time of each task and for, yeah, for each task and the number of teams per, um, sorry, um, the number of teams per resource type. And for each service provider after that, um, 
we run a traveling salesman problem or vehicle re routing problem first maximizing the minimum slack and i will point out that this is different than the typical uh, objective of a um, vrp uh, usually it's minimizing the traveling distance but in our case we would like to have a robust schedule so for us it's important to uh, maximize the minimum slack that time that a team, so as resources, I would like to also mention that we are focusing on teams who are doing those tasks, that they have enough time going from one task to another. So that if there are any little delays in between, they can recover from them. And also we try to balance the workload because there, are, there will be several teams and we would like to balance the workload. And after that, uh, we maximize the total slack. Uh, our approach is a uh, basically actually a lexicographic approach where we have uh, so we first start with optimization uh, with the project scheduling problem and with resource project, resource constrained project scheduling problem and then we move to a uh, wave routing problem or TSP and then uh, at the maximizing total slack part uh, because we cannot get a solution in a reasonable time we move to a large neighborhood search so um we use oops, sorry we use each um so we get an initial solution and we apply this large neighborhood search string two routes and repairing those two routes using again the cp model the maximizing total slack and after that, we evaluate the solution at the end using a discrete event simulation. So the CP formulation um, looks like this. Uh, as I said, we start minimizing the cost of tardiness uh, for the project scheduling problem at the first step, uh, where we have the precedence constraints and we make sure that the, um, some of the tasks they need to start as soon as an aircraft arrives and some needs to finish a certain time before a scheduled off block time which is the time when the aircraft starts pushed back and um and also we have some uh we have a disjunctive constraint for the uh, space uh limitation the, the one i mentioned with the toilet servicing and uh water supply and uh, so that they cannot happen at the same time and um, what else we have, so we, at the second stage, after we get the minimum tardiness, we fix that value. And at the second stage, we minimize the sum of resources across the whole service providers. And here we have a cumulative constraints giving the number of resources at any given time. And the, uh, we have also this uh, CP formulation for multi TSP and VRP with time windows. Uh, in the first stage, uh, we maximize the minimum slack, as I mentioned before. And this is based on also the um, priorities. So what is more important to us, we start from that objective. So it's important first to maximize the minimum slack and uh, in the second stage uh, by keeping the maximum slack minimum slack value we maximize the workload balance and after that uh, with a bound uh, we use a, we, uh, the objective is maximizing the sum of all slack and our constraints are the circuit constraints making sure that all are connected we have a big circuit and uh, we have all different constraints which ensures that the successors are all different and um, we assign a root value to these end nodes um, then the seventh one is the again the successor of the the root of the successor is the same with the with task itself and the so what we have here is the start time so the start time of each task here in uh, vrp is coming from actually our cpsv so that's what we uh, pass um and then we calculate the busy time of each task the time that 
each uh, team is busy while doing the task and after with the traveling and replenishment if it's needed. Not every vehicle, every operation needs replenishment. So that's why we have TSP and VRP based on the being capacitated or not. And we also this constraint that the successor cannot start before the predecessor is finished. And uh, we also calculate the slack time here. Um, and the, we calculate initial vehicle capacity, uh, the remaining capacity after each visit and the replenishment uh, if we need it or not. Um, and finally, we calculate this workload, the duration of the workload. And the large neighborhood search here, we have a very simple one. So uh, destroying two randomly chosen routes and repairing them using CP with the last objective, maximizing some of delay. And the details of the optimization steps are uh, as shown in actually in total almost um, like five steps. Um, so the good thing is that we used uh, Minazing with, with its Python interface and we were able to solve the formulated problem using different solvers and at different steps. So starting from PSV, RCPSV using Chuffed, which performed very well. And we have used also different search strategies, with, which also worked well with the chosen uh, ones. And then going to uh, VRP and TSP part again, uh, for instance, we started with uh, G-code using a G-code solver, uh, which gave a very fast result uh, when maximizing the minimum slack. However, it couldn't uh, prove optimality for that. So that's why we uh, passed, uh, we had a warm start for, um, sorry, um, we had a warm start and we solved it using Groby, which proved the optimality in just a second. And the other ones we have used G-code as well with, again, different search strategies. Um, so we have used a real instance from Barcelona Airport and we generated four other instances based on that with a different turnaround, uh, number of turnarounds and the time uh, duration. It took approximately 45 minutes to run everything, but uh, I didn't do it individually. So I could have done it in parallel. Then it would have taken just seven minutes because each service provider in the VRP part, it can be solved just uh, in parallel. Um, and the optimality was proven for minimizing tardiness, minimizing the total resources and maximizing the minimum slack. And the workload balance objective, which uh, differs between zero and 66 minutes, and we start after a certain time limit, and the optimality was not really necessary for this one. And the average optimality gap for maximizing total slack was uh, around zero point, sorry, around yeah, 0 0.68, and for uh, other instances, the minimum gap was 2.72 percent and the average solution time for the large neighborhood search was around 1.78 minutes and if optimized using Groby it would have taken just around one hour which was a uh, lot. And when we check the comparison uh, I just want to point out here that we have compared um, our objective with maximizing minimum slack and sum of slack with the typical objective of the vehicle routing problem, minimizing the traveling distance. And for each instance, actually, we can see that uh, for this type of problem where we uh, focus on um, getting a robust solution, actually maximizing the minimum slag objective works much better compared to the travel one. And finally, this is the results from the simulation. The first column gives the uh, number of delay uh, percentage of the uh, aircraft and the second column it gives the total of um, total delays and each shows the one with the objective of slack and the other one with the traveling distance and then the last column shows that the sum of uh, delays which are greater than 15 minutes 
And we can see that as they are bolded, the ones uh, with using uh, the objective of slack, it actually performs much better compared to the other one. And thank you so much. If you have any questions, uh, yeah, happy to answer. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll try to get back on schedule. Maybe uh, one question. Let's see. Um, you um, so for your LNS, you destroy two full roots and then try to rebuild. Um, can you give us uh, tell us a bit why you chose that neighborhood as opposed to I mean, there are a no number of things you could have done. Um, I've tried a few one actually. I've also tried uh, the one focusing on the time windows, kind of uh, destroying um, a period and, in time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And this one actually worked better. So um, it, it had more flexibility to uh, come up with a better solution, I guess. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so Sorry about the issues. That, that's fine, don't worry about it. Um, so we will move on to the third talk entitled Leveraging Constraint Scheduling, a case study to the textile industry. Welcome everyone, I am Alexandre Mercier-Aubin, a grad student from the Université Laval in Quebec. Uh, I've written this paper with Jonathan Godot and Claude Guy Quimper. So let's get into it. So we have an industrial partner in the textile industry that funded our project. They proposed a scheduling problem and we developed a mathematical model which we coupled with a search heuristic based on the traveling salesman problem. So our problem is to schedule non-preemptive tasks on looms. The tasks are pieces of textiles to weave. There are sequence-dependent setup times to get a loom ready for its next task. Each loom is a disjunctive resource. A loom can only weave one piece of fabric at a time. There are cumulative resources, which are the different employees working on the setups. Um, the pool of workers is different for every setup type, but what are the setup types? There are major and minor setups. The major setups configure a loom so it can weave different types of textiles. There is at the most one major setup per horizon of two weeks, so we decided to use an horizon of two weeks. The planification team usually create their schedule for only a week. We also present a list of the different number of employees of every profession. On a minor setup, the following profession will interact with the loom in a fixed order. Some profession might not always be needed. So there will be um, a weaver, beam tire, and finally the mechanics. Pieces of textiles are compatible with a set of loom configuration. We already know which task will be ex executed on which loom. The tasks are scheduled either before or after the major setup according to their compatibility. Pieces of textiles have a style which includes the thread type, color, weaving pattern, and much more. Two tasks with the same style are basically the same. For example, if you have three tasks, A, B, and C, and the task A as the same style as the task B. Then the setup time from A to C and B to C will be the exact same duration. In our problem, we have many pieces of textile to weave. Um, in our instances, it ranges between 571 and 841. Here is a simple example of a schedule with two looms. In this example, there is one employee of each profession. Each timeline represents a loom. Each rectangle represents a setup or a task during the timeline. If we look at the beginning of this timeline, we see that there's two mechanics overlapping on the different looms. Since there's not enough employees to do both tasks at the same time, we have to delay the second task. The same thing happens for bigger problems when we run out of resources. Since our model is pretty big, I split it in two. So let's go ahead and explain what's going on here. Bubbles will explain letters. 
The first equation shows our objective function, which is to minimize the weighted tardiness. It is essentially the sum of lateness weighted by task priority. Since there's at most one major setup per horizon of two weeks, and that we're scheduled for an horizon of two weeks, then it means that we can part every task by whether they're compatible with the initial configuration or not. Then we must model the disjunctive resources. Equation 4 says that a minor setup can start before the end of its task, while equation 5 encodes the fixed profession order. In this equation, T is a matrix that encodes setup durations, and M is an next job array. Equation 6 states that as soon as the minor setup is done, the loom must start weaving. To model the next job array, we use the circuit constraint on line 9. So let's say that we have a task i. The value at the position i and n will be the next job of i. In order to model the looms individually in the next job array, we use sentinel job. Those tasks are at the end of every loom and they point to the first job of another loom. Equations 7 and 8 allow us to force the loom order for the sentinel jobs. Then equation 10 and 11 are cumulative constraints to model the worker pools. 10 is for the minor setups, while 11 is for the major setups. The final equation allows us to create a symmetry break for jobs with the same style. Two jobs with the same style and due date can be ordered by ID. This is due to the fact that they have the exact same transition matrix. Since we use the traveling salesperson problem to define our search heuristic, um, why don't we take a bit of time to explain what it is exactly? So there's a, a traveling salesperson that goes from city to city in order to sell the, his products. At the end of the day, the salesperson wants to go back home in order to rest. So he's willing to find the shortest circuit that goes through all the cities that he wants to visit. In other words, he wants to find the shortest Hamiltonian cycle that goes through all these cities. But you're probably wondering, how does it relate to scheduling? So let's say that we have a simple TSP problem with four cities, A, B, C, and D. The edges represent distances between every city. The shortest Hamiltonian cycle is in blue. To convert it into a scheduling problem, we can add a dummy node. This dummy node represents the start of a schedule. It is conveniently named node 0 since all of its edges are of weight 0. Instead of the node being cities, they represent tasks to schedule and the edges are setup times between each job. So basically we end up with a solution to a scheduling problem without considering let's say cumulative resources and such. But it can be a good start for an initial solution or an initial value for the variables affected by the circuit constraint. So we can use it to create a proper schedule by introducing the cumulative constraint manually and we can also use it to just extract the circuit that we can use as a search heuristic later on. So as I said earlier, we have four different data sets with uh, an increasingly high number of tasks we wanted to see how our algorithm would scale with uh, different numbers of tasks, so we ended up cutting our dataset into smaller pieces. So from the different datasets, we sampled randomly different tasks. The first cut being 10% of its original size, then the second being 20, and so on, until we reach 100%. This way, we could compare the different methods on increasingly difficult problems. So we tested two basic heuristics. The circuit method uses a TSP solver to produce a circuit that will be used to generate a solution. Greedy, however, simply sorts tasks by due date. Both of those are heuristics, so they won't give the optimal solution, but they're quick to compute. To fairly compare the basic heuristic without solver to a CP solver, we introduced the random circuit which will be used as a branching heuristic to set the values of the n-array. 
Compared to heuristics, search heuristics explore the whole tree. Therefore, it will eventually find the best solution. We can also extract the circuits of both heuristics and use them as branching heuristics. We've also validated if the large neighborhood search would improve solutions for or search heuristics. Every method is given a timeout of 15 minutes. This is how we compare the different methods explained in the previous slide. In this figure, the x-axis shows the number of tasks for each instance. On the y-axis, we see the weighted tardiness. We group the different dots by the method used. The three methods compared are circuit, greedy, and cp plus random. Every solution of every instance is represented by a dot in this figure. The colors of the dots change from green to blue according to how fast they were found. So here we basically compare two heuristics to a CP solver. Here we see that the circuit heuristic finds similar solution to CP plus random, while CP plus random continues to find better solutions over time. We also see that circuit is quick to compute. But what would happen if we decided to merge both? In this figure, both axes remains the same, while we used different groups and methods. Here, every method uses constraint programming since it was the best approach of last figure. We also use different search heuristics such as greedy and CP to initialize or end circuit. On the Y axis, we show results produced with the LNS or not. By analyzing this figure, we can see that the CP plus circuit is the clear winner. This is due to the fact that it actually finds better solution than CP plus greedy. And if you look well, C++ plus random doesn't even find solution for all the instances. For some reason, the LNS seemed to work better with C++ plus greedy and C++ plus circuit. My guess is that since we've got a good initial circuit, it's easier to fix a few tasks than trying to correct a poorly made initial circuit. So overall, the best approach for a problem is CP plus circuit plus LNS. It is more stable since it found solution to all of our instances. It offers better performance by finding better objective value for the different instances. The solutions with this search heuristics are usually found faster than with others. Therefore, we can say that it solves our industrial partner's problem. To conclude, we can say that we've designed a new TSP-based search heuristic. This search heuristic offers good solutions for our problem, and the solutions are found in reasonable computation time. Best of all, this algorithm has been implemented in the system of our industrial partner. And this alone could motivate our contribution. So thank you all for listening, and I'll leave you with a couple of references. Thank you. Are there any questions? Maybe uh, one question uh, running behind. Authors are here. Oh, Tanya has a question. Go ahead. Uh, I, I don't see it. Oh, okay. No, I thought she was on. Okay. Um, no questions. Uh, I may have, so I may have missed it. But um, what do you do for LNS? What do you? How do you? Uh, this. What part of the solution do you destroy? Uh, well, it's random. Like we choose a, a set of looms to reset, and we clear all the jobs on the on those looms. So you, you pick those looms uh, uh, at random? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, thank uh, Are there publicly available instances from the menu editor? Uh, no, sadly, we can't share the instances since we, uh, we are on a contract with our industrial partner. So uh, it, it's private, sadly. Mm -hmm. And to complete the answer, we are working to, uh, with the partner to make the code available but the instances will not be uh, available. Okay, thank you. Uh, sadly, we need to move on. Uh, but again, there's a Q&A uh, um, session right after this. Uh, so you can, uh, you'll have a chance to ask more questions. So let's move on to the last uh, talk, data-driven construction of financial factor models. I'm going to be talking to you about how to construct financial factor models in a data-driven fashion. This is the work that I've conducted uh, alongside my supervisor, Rory Kwan, at the University of Toronto. Now, before I talk to you about how to construct these factor models, I want to tell you what these factor models are. <clears throat> 
So they are frameworks that allow us to uh, model asset returns in terms of these uh, different financial factors or risk drivers. So the model usually looks like this, where you have R, the response vector, or the return vector of a uh, single financial asset I. You have X, which is a matrix of factor loadings, and then we map those to the returns using a function F that is parameterized by the factor loadings beta. And then finally, we have epsilon, which are the errors. Now, when we're creating factor models, we go through two different tasks. First, we have to select which uh, factors to use. That's called feature selection. And then second, we need to map these features to the returns, and that's feature engineering. Now, what we find a lot in um, the industry is that people either use uh, a set of factors that they've selected a priori, or they just take all the factors that they have uh, and use those in their model, which may cause overfitting and poor out of sample um, accuracy. <clears throat> And then what they also usually do is they just take a linear model and create a factor model out of that without considering any other nonlinear um, alternatives. Now, in the industry, there's what's called the factor zoo, right? There's about 300 plus factors that have been identified to have statistically significant uh, effect uh, on the returns. And <clears throat> what might happen if we use all those is that we tend to overfit. So what we want to do is we want to create a framework that tames this factor zoo in a data-driven fashion. And how are we going to do that? We're going to use a two-stage framework to construct these factor models. So in the first framework, we're going to be doing dimensionality reduction. Specifically, first, we're going to be comparing linear methods such as auto shrinkage or lasso, least, absolute, least angle regression selector or LARS, as well as a mixed integer-based best subset selection um, model based on the work of Bert Simas uh, and his collaborators in 2016. We're going to be comparing those to a nonlinear dimensionality reduction method called autoencoder, which is a neural-based architecture that allows for nonlinear dimensionality reduction where we create these new latent factors that live in this bottleneck layer and we're going to be using those as input to our factor models. And then in the second stage where we're doing feature engineering, we're going to be comparing linear models as well as nonlinear models um, that are uh, represented by feedforward neural networks. Now, we're using these neural networks because they can represent any given uh, continuous function, and we can train them in a data-driven fashion. So what we wind up having is three different models that grow in their nonlinearity, as well as the opacity of the model, right? So at first we have a model that does linear subset selection as well as a linear regression for the feature engineering. Then we have linear feature uh, selection and a nonlinear model. And then finally, we're gonna be using the autoencoder and the nonlinear model, which are both nonlinear in the dimensionality reduction or the feature selection as well as the feature engineering. So first comparing the linear feature selection methods, the three that we had mentioned earlier, we find that the best subset selection, the MIP-based, um, model outperforms all the other um, models in sample, specifically in that it uh, selects factors that are in accordance with our economic expectations. So if you take a look at the heat map on the right over here, we find that when the subset is small, what it selects are the uh, industry portfolios uh, that belong to the certain asset. And then as the subset grows, it starts selecting cross-sectional factors, whereas Lars, for example, does a very poor job of uh, navigating um, that selection behavior in accordance with the economic expectations. And then out of sample, we also found that it performs better and more consistently in terms of the adjusted R squared or the explained variance that takes into account the number of factors that we're using. So we wind up having three different models, as we said before. For the linear feature selection and feature model, we're going to be using the best subset selection. For the other two, we're going to be first using the best subset selection, take those factors, and then train a neural network using only those. And then for the two-stage autoencoded model, we're going to be training a few autoencoders discarding the decoders and then just passing the factors that are in the latent space into a feedforward neural network. And what we found was that uh, there was statistically significant improvement in accuracy in terms of the mean squared error between the different frameworks, not the different loss functions. But the loss functions here are the least absolute deviation and the least squared regression. What we also found was that the second stage nonlinearity uh, added by the neural network uh, leads to statistically significant improvement in accuracy, but we found that the accuracy that uh, we gained from the first stage nonlinearity due to the autoencoder was not statistically significant. Um, that's it. Thank you for watching uh, this brief uh, summary, and I look forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you. So this uh, concludes this uh, session. So I encourage you to
go into the individual Q&A uh, sessions for any of the talks in this session or in the previous talk. So I thank again all the speakers.